Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to give the first talk this morning. I have been doing a research project, a very unusual research project in breast cancer. Uh, as mentioned, I'm at Harvard School of Public Health. I have an appointment in London and at, at uh, Monterey, Mexico. So what I'm going to present to you is my research with a number of colleagues. We think that in breast cancer, the early relapses are events that are triggered by events around the time of surgery, and we think that the surgery causes a short period of inflammation, systemic inflammation, in the first week or two after surgery, and that's when most of the events are triggered that lead to uh, early relapse. Uh, this is published, uh, published a paper last year in uh, Current Medicinal Chemistry. And as mentioned, uh, I am on the board of directors of the Colon Cancer Alliance. I have a patent, I have two patents pending, and this work was funded by the Coleman Foundation. So that uh, current medicinal paper is online. You can access it, open access. Much of what I talk about will be covered in that paper. Okay, this project started approximately 20 years ago. I was attending a conference in Europe and met Romano Demichelli in the hallway with a poster showing an unusual bimodal relapse pattern in breast cancer. This is an unexpected uh, event and uh, it was quite interesting. So I walked into the conference room and Michael Baum was presenting a database from UK, from London, that also showed a bimodal relapse pattern. We three got together afterwards and <clears throat> discovered that they were both talking about the same thing, and we decided to collaborate. I'll show you the data later, but in general, this is a relatively small database, 1,173 patients without chemotherapy, just a surgical removal of the primary tumor with mastectomy, and then they followed these patients for 20 years and watched, monitored for relapse. What they found was there's a sharp early peak at about 18 months in relapse, and in 50 months there seems to be a minimum, and then it started up again 60 to 70 months with a broad tail extending out to 20 years. Uh, this pattern once you recognize it, it can be identified in other databases. Okay, these are the database. This is the data from Milan. Uh, this is an analysis by Demma Kelly. You can see the early relapse peak at about 18 months. This, by the way, this is hazard of relapse. Hazard is the probability of having a relapse event during a certain period of time if you enter this period of time disease-free. So a hazard rate of 0 0.02 means that 2% of the people who enter this three-month window have a relapse event. So there's an early relapse peak at about 18 months, and then it seems to be a minimum, and then there's a second broad peak at about 60, 70 months. Uh, this, this is noise, but we see this in almost every database. So there's an early relapse peak, and then there's late relapse peaks. And this was, this is for postmenopausal patients. <clears throat> if you look for premenopausal patients <clears throat> doing the same thing, you see there's some structure in the early peak. Seems to be a, a 10 month event and a 30 month event. We see the same late relapses extending out to 10, 20 years. If you look at these data in the more conventional disease free survival format, 100% of the patients are disease-free at the time of surgery, and then as time goes on, there are a lot of relapses, and it seems to reach a small plateau here, and then it starts up again. It drops off again. This is not an artifact. This is actually uh, similar, exactly the same as the early relapse peaks, but just presented differently. This was presented by Bonadonna Valagusa in New England Journal. Bonadonna was a clinician, and Valagusa has been a database manager for 20 odd years. Okay, we, we've seen this sort of data pattern in data from US, 
uh, Europe and Asia. I will show you a few of them. I will show you the uh, Fisher data, and I'm not sure I have a slide, but I might show you the uh, Safner data. At any rate, all these papers, if you look carefully, you can see a bimodal relapse pattern. And if I have a star there, that means that the authors say there's a bimodal relapse pattern. If there's no star, it's obvious visually that there is a bimodal relapse pattern. Okay, these are the uh, Fisher et al. data. This, this, uh, these data, this is published 30 years ago. It was published in Cancer in 1984, but until we did the analysis with the Milan data and took a careful look at this. It's obvious that this, is, this also shows it. What you see here, these are the, this is the disease-free survival for the next 12 years <clears throat> for patients. And these are the node negative patients, uh, nodes negative, <coughs> nodes, <coughs> number of nodes, <coughs> excuse me, the number of nodes positive on the side where the uh, breast cancer was is a very strong prognostic factor. So nodes negative is a good prognostic factor. You can see that a surgery alone cures 80% of the patients. They don't need anything else. They will never have a problem. The 20% who relapse, you can see that about 10% of them relapse within the first three, four years, and then there seems to be a plateau, and then it starts up again, and you see the second wave of relapses. For the worst prognosis patients, 12 nodes positive, you see a very strong early relapse pattern, and then it seems to stop for a while, and then it starts up again. This is exactly what we saw in the Milan data, but until we identified <coughs> this paper that's been around for 30 years uh, was not recognized as, as being equivalent in data. Uh, it had always been assumed that there was no such thing as a bimodal relapse pattern. We, everyone thought there was one mode of relapse, and this was not expected. So the next thing to do was, what does this mean, and how can we stop it? Can we prevent it? Uh, a couple references here that aren't especially important. So what we did in 1993, after we first identified it, I got a small grant, and we took the Milan database. We took a growth model from Demma Kelly. Demma Kelly is an MD, PhD. He did a lot of work with animal model studies. He said that the simplest way to explain how cancer grows is it starts in a single cell, and it starts to divide, and it goes to a point where it can't be sustained until the body provides a, a, a vascular supply. And it may stop at that point, uh, at that one millimeter or so size. And then angiogenesis occurs, and it can grow indefinitely. And but Dan Kelly said it's possible that it might remain dormant at the single cell level, and it might remain dormant for a period of time before this vascular event occurs. So I took Demma Kelly's growth model and the Milan data, and using computer simulation, tried to understand what those relapse events mean. And this is what uh, the result was. These are the Milan data in, in solid line. You see the first, this is for the premenopausal patients. You see the early wave of relapse with the two separate events. We, we suggested that the first 10 month relapses were actually something that the effect of surgery, something about the time of surgery caused angiogenesis of avascular micrometastases. In other words, there were tumors sitting there at the one millimeter size, relatively stable, but something at the time of surgery induced angiogenesis systemically and those were relapses that occurred at the first 10 months. The 30-month events were single cells that were sitting dormant in some, uh, some fashion or other, we did not know, but the fact of surgery caused these single cells to start to divide, and they showed up as relapses at about 30 months. The late relapses, we said, were events that were not synchronized to the surgery. So, Three modes of relapse were identified by this, and uh, this was all new information. 
So we did a computer simulation. These are the two early relapses. Yeah, I, this is just a computer simulation showing how sharp the cur curves are. This is the 10-month event and the 30-month event. And this, these are the late relapses. And what I'm showing here is that we're able to change the size of this peak by turning by using an anti-angiogenic drug as a simulation. And this is our these are data from Milan, premenopausal patients in red. This is the hazard of relapse for premenopausal patients. And the blue line is what we used uh, from our computer simulation to try and match these data. So what I'm showing here is that with our computer simulation, we can mimic the relapses for real patient population. And in this case, we picked uh, premenopausal patients. Could have picked any population, and we could have done it. This is just a demonstration of our ability. So the general results of the simulation were that there were two previously unreported surgery-induced relapse modes, and that singles, uh, that, well, the 20% of premenopausal node-positive patients undergo a surgery-induced stimulation of angiogenesis. And this was 5 to 1 node positive to node negative and 2 to 1 pre to postmenopausal. So it's mainly uh, important for premenopausal node positive patients. The 30 month peak were single cells that were induced into division. And the late peak, 50 months to 200 months, is more or less the natural history of the disease. Uh, we had access to a, uh, a chemotherapy uh, database from, uh, from Milan. So these are, these are, this is the hazard of relapse for untreated uh, premenopausal patients. And this is the hazard of relapse for the treated patients. So what we show here is that the effect of chemotherapy, CMF is a standard chemotherapy after surgery, the effect of chemotherapy is to attenuate the early relapses. This is not unexpected because these are the cancers that are actively growing right in the months post-surgery. That's when they found out that chemotherapy is most effective. Chemotherapy seems to have very little effect on the late relapses. Uh, we've seen similar events in other cancers, uh, pancreatic melanoma, lung cancer, prostate, and osteosarcoma, and I might add kidney cancer. It turns out we might have rediscovered something that was known 2,000 years ago. It turns out that uh, Celsus and Galen of 2,000 years ago were able to actually remove breast cancers and the patients survived. You know, it's remarkable. But what they found, what they found, at least uh, uh, indicating from their writings, uh, Celsus, uh, first there was the cacoethes, then carcinoma without ulceration, then the fungating ulcer. That would be an early description of staging of breast cancer. And none of these can be removed but the cacoethes, the smallest ones. The rest are irritated by Every method of cure, the more violent the operation, the more angry they grow. And this cancer getting angry is a common term among oncologists. After an excision, it recurs, bringing with it a cause of death, whatever by using no extirpation, prolong lives, notwithstanding the disorder to an extreme old age. This is, of course, relative to the lifespan of people in those years. Uh, Gallen said something similar. He was the first one to introduce the concept of humors being responsible for cancer. This theory dominated um, medicine for a thousand years. He, he called uh, the term canc uh, crab to describe cancer. And he said, we have often cured this disease in the early stages, but after it has grown to a noticeable size, no one has cured it with surgery. So it was remarkable, 2,000 years ago, physicians had discovered that the small cancers can be resected, the larger cancers better left alone. 
Okay, uh, we can correlate these observations with, cl with some clinical observations in breast cancer. First of all, adjuvant chemotherapy works best by far for premenopausal node positive patients. And that we explain as reasonable in that this surgery induced angiogenesis causes very rapid growth in the first few months after surgery. So the, chemo the chemotherapy should be most effective. And there was a paper with uh, myself, Bonadonna, and Folkman. Judah Folkman was the, the guy who, who first uh, discovered uh, the concept of angiogenesis. And Bonadonna was uh, the first person to use multiple cancer drugs as adjuvant therapy in breast cancer. So 30 years of, of chemotherapy experience and 30 years of angiogenesis experience, they both agreed that this is a reasonable explanation. It turns out that mammography, early detection of cancer, works better for women in their 50s than it does for women in their 40s. And that makes sense to us that the surgery causes tumor growth and that partially offsets the advantage of finding early cancer. So we published several papers. And this also can provide an explanation for the racial disparity in cancer. Uh, Isaac Gukas was one of my co-authors, a late Isaac Gukas. We published three papers a few years ago saying that breast cancer in, in blacks is mainly uh, premenopausal and breast cancer in whites is mainly postmenopausal. So this is a partial explanation for the racial disparity in outcome. Okay, I, I would summarize the early work as something the most important finding was that something happens at or at around the time of surgery to precipitate the early wave of relapses. And most relapses in breast cancer are early. And surgery apparently in induces angiogenesis of dormant avascular micrometastases and starts growth from single cancer cells. And this may be a general effect. We found it in breast cancer because we studied extensively we think it happens in many other cancers. Uh, skipping to 2010, a paper by a Belgian anesthesiology group, uh, Patrice Forget et al. They looked at a retrospective study of the previous 300 mastectomies done at their one hospital under care of one surgeon and given standard therapy, and they looked at the outcome for these 300 odd patients and group them by what drug the anesthesiologist used uh, when he provided the anesthesiology. And it turned out that one drug was far superior to the others. This is the hazard of relapse for that one drug, Catorolac. This drug has been around for 20 years. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So these are the other an, uh, analgesics, and these are the Catorolac-treated patients. And there's a big difference in early relapses. Then McKelly and I went out and visited uh, Forget, went over their data and updated it. And uh, this is uh, Dan McKelly's analysis. There is a five-fold reduction in early relapses with the use of this Catorolac. Nothing else is different. In the period between uh, Nine and 18 months, there are three versus 15 events, and there are a fair number of patients involved. This is very, very strong evidence to us, suggesting that something about an NSAID seems to reduce early relapses. So we did a little investigation, and we explored the relationship among a family of possible things, inflammation, cancer surgery, NSAIDs, angiogenesis, tumor growth, circulating tumor cells, and circulating tumor cells released during surgery. I mean, this is a very large list of a, of a number of very extensive topics. Okay, uh, my original interest was directed to inflammation, and I can tell you exactly how that happened. There was a paper submitted to one of the journals, uh, uh, I think it was Journal Can Cancers, Cancer, <coughs> Biomed Central, cancer. And this was a case report from Lebanon of a 44-year-old smoker 
was diagnosed with inoperable non-small cell lung cancer. And he was treated with radiation, <clears throat> no surgery, and he was doing well about 15 months later, and he bumped his head in a little car accident, bumped his head on the, on the uh, headboard of the, of the car, and 15 months later, he got a rapidly growing tumor there, seven centimeter tumor growth in 30 days. So they, the authors cited this as a, as a case report and presented all these data and x-rays and everything else and uh, submitted it to the paper. The paper asked me to review it. I went over the case in detail. I said what they described with this tumor was nothing like what we described. This, what we proposed was not an explanation of this. Something else might have happened. And what we suggested was that maybe the, this is my published comment, uh, these are the authors, El Sager, circulating cancer cells were entrapped at the trauma site, probably close to the truth. We think that that's what happened, that it was nothing about surgery-induced angiogenesis or surgery-induced single cell growth. This was a new effect, and the unusual, isolated, and exaggerated situation allowed El Sagaradel to observe what may be a new and possibly important hematologic metastatic pathway, inflammation as a facilitating precursor to tumor. And in general, metastasis is a very inefficient process. You have many cancer cells circulating in a patient's blood, but only a few metastases occur. This might be a way for cancer cells to bypass extravasation. If you have inflammation and a cancer cell can just get right into tissue. Uh, I don't want to go through all these in detail, but there's an extensive literature describing what may be going on. Uh, Martin's Green et al. that uh, circulating uh, uh, virus in, in their animal model, in their, in their uh, avian model. Cancer grows at every site of wounding and is correlated with inflammation. It's been known for a long time that chronic inflammation leads to tumor growth. Uh, genetic uh, damage is the match that lights the fire, then inflammation is the fuel that feeds the flames. Uh, there are a couple reports showing that there's an inflammatory response after resection of colon surgery. A marker IL-6 is in serum at a reasonable level, and it seems to be there for about a week. Uh, Perez Rivas et al. in 2012, inflammation markers in blood in serum after surgery. And the inflammatory response is initiated by tissue damage and can be intensified by mast cells which release histamine, markedly increases the permeability of adjacent capillaries. Blood speed in capillaries is a very small 0.05 centimeters per second compared to 40, 50 centimeters per second in the large arteries, which would make leaky capillaries a very efficient way for cancer cells in circulation to be injected into tissue. Uh, I looked up a paper 100 years ago Jones and Rua from 100 years ago, the localization of secondary tumors at points of injury has been so often remarked upon that it's unnecessary to cite specific instances. Cause unknown. So this is a period of time when people walked around with cancer, and if you get a bruise, you can get a tumor growing there. Uh, more uh, reports here. Uh, Carhade, uh, well established that cancer patients have circulating tumor cells, and this correlates with early relapse. Uh, there is a Pachman uh, report, there's a surge in circulating tumor cells after surgery that shows up a few days later. It's been known that cancer usurps the wound healing process, so perhaps the surgery produces this wound healing mechanism that is hardwired into all of us, and that's the mechanism by which surgery causes this early relapse. Uh, platelets actively sequester angiogenic factors, pro and anti-angiogenic factors, 
and they degranulate in the presence of inflammation. So you can imagine after surgery, the whole body is flooded with, with uh, anti and pro and uh, angiogenesis promoters. And there's a 10% dip in platelets post-surgery, so that fits. Uh, it turns out that when they use Catorolac, there's l reduced use of opioids, which opioids are known to have some pro-angiogenic effect. And uh, it's well known that, uh, an that the use of uh, another NSAID aspirin can reduce mortality from breast and colon cancer after two years of use. This is a general block diagram of what we think is going on. The, there are two pathways to relapse, a late relapse pathway down this way and early relapse pathway this way that seems to have different properties. The late relapses are more or less what people have thought, that the primary cancer sloughs off cancer cells, they get in circulation, they get deposited in marrow or other reservoir, and they're in circulation before, during, and after surgery, and they eventually get into tissue causing the late relapses. The early relapses are accelerated by primary surgery, transient systemic inflammation for about a week after surgery, cells released at about the time of surgery, and the inflammatory process just allows circulating tumor cells, any cancer cells in the system to be injected into tissue, resulting in the early relapses. So our conclusions, the early relapses which constitute the majority of relapses in breast cancer are surges of angiogenesis and single cell growth, and they're, primer, they're triggered by primary surgery. Late relapses are not in that category. The Forget retrospective data suggests that this perioperative NSAID, Catorolac, reduces early relapses by fivefold. This is a $5 drug given once during the patient history. There is a clinical trial uh, scheduled, or there's a phase two clinical trial underway in Brussels conducted by Forget. And there's a phase three scheduled to start in Seoul, uh, South Korea, later on this year. Uh, data suggest that transient systemic inflammation that's been identified after colon and breast surgery is the precipitating factor in circulating tumor cells and cells released via surgery, including cancer stem cells re released from marrow. And the presence of transient systemic inflammation could account for the single cell activation and the angiogenesis that was prevented by NSAID. There are a number of mechanisms by which angiogenesis can happen from uh, inflammation. And we think the relapses avoided by the Forget et al. data do not show up later. Uh, breast cancer is the disease that takes its course in over a decade, but we think most of the events that lead to relapse occurred in the week after surgery. And we think that this metastatic process is enhanced a hundredfold during the week or so after surgery. And importantly, this is a host response. It seems, theoretically, it seems to have very little to do with the genotype of the cancer cell. Uh, phase three clinical trials scheduled to begin in, in Seoul, and you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and search for breast cancer and Catorolac, and you'll see these, this trial scheduled. These are my colleagues, uh, Michael Baum, a surgeon from UK, the late Isaac Gukas, uh, originally from Nigeria, and he was a surgeon in UK, as Romano Demichelli, as Bill Ryshevsky, and Judah Folkman, I was on his staff for about 12 years. This is Patrice Forget. Uh, this is Jay Ant Vieta. And uh, this is Rick Rogers. This is taken in uh, downtown Newark in the Ironbound area. Okay, thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Yes, sir. Very intriguing observation. Um, the first time you showed that graph with the very early spike, the first thing that came to mind was, of course, well, the tumor secretes something along the line of endostatin, angiostatin, 
and by removing the primary tumor, you're removing the anti-angiogenic factor. But you have this long list of cancers, some of which were not known to produce that. Then IL-6 came in as a player which could be pro-angiogenic, which might be induced by TNF-alpha. So I was trying to, to connect your results to molecular events. Would you know a little bit more specifically what these events are? Uh, actually, we don't. We, we have I've identified a certain clinical event. We've identified that NSAID seems to block it. It seems like inflammation plays a role. We don't know the details. We really don't know the details. And what we would like to do is to do some prospective studies, take bloods before surgery, and then for the number of days after surgery, and, and watch the events, and you can explore all these things, and we can do this with and without the NSAID, we should be able to explain it. But to answer your question, we don't know the details. There are many possibilities. Any other questions? I have one question. Yes. Go ahead. For the uh, anti-inflammatory medicine, so you say that only one medicine show the most effective. So uh, so what's the reason the other anti-inflammatory uh, doesn't work? That, that was the only uh, of those drugs that was an NSAID. That's the only one that showed an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, anti-inflammatory effect. So we, this, this, this suggested to us that inflammation is, is, is the major process here. So you have tried the other anti-inflammatory uh, drugs? They have not. The, the, the other standard drugs that they use as analgesics are non-NSAID. So this was, the, that Ketorolac is the only NSAID of all the drugs that they used at this, ho this is a teaching hospital for anesthesiologists, so they have to explore all the the drugs so, so that the residents get a chance to see all the side effects. Mm 